The United Kingdom is in crisis. The pound has crashed. The Bank of England has had to step in to prevent pension funds from collapsing. And the Chancellor is enjoying champagne receptions with hedge fund managers who profit from the fall in value of the pound. Meanwhile, parents, pensioners, and children skip meals and live in cold homes, terrified of turning the heating on through fear of soaring energy bills. It is little wonder, therefore, that the opposition just recorded the biggest poll lead in terms of voter intention in the United Kingdom since the mid to late 1990s. Sky-high energy bills, which threatened to cause a national catastrophe, were expected to be the refining issue of new Prime Minister Liz Truss's premiership. Despite being a free market zealot, who spent much of her leadership campaign lauding the idea of a small state and deriding government intervention, it was clear that, on this issue, Truss would have little option but to intervene. The roughly £150 billion package, designed to freeze energy bills at only double what they were a year ago for the next two years, rather than letting them treble or quadruple by handing billions to the energy companies, had already been announced before the new Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng unveiled his so-called mini-budget. The market had already priced in that intervention, which is bigger than the entire UK government intervention during the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, without too much disruption. But it was the announcement that Kwarteng would be giving away a further £45 billion in tax cuts, targeted primarily at the already very wealthy and extremely high earners, including totally abolishing the top rate of tax in the United Kingdom, that really sent markets into freefall. Almost every one of the financial cataclysms caused by the mini-budget, and the decades of mismanagement of the nation's finances that led us to this point, whether that be tax cuts, the devaluation of the pound, or rising interest rates, either will have, or already have had, enormous knock-on effects for football in this country, which is particularly significant, given that the United Kingdom is home to the biggest, richest, and most popular league in all of world football. There are those who say that football and politics don't mix. Clearly, just on a purely factual basis, that isn't true, as this video is about to illustrate. But if you are someone who doesn't enjoy hearing about the way in which football and politics interact, as has been the case with a few people in the comments on this channel in the past with previous videos, this is just a content warning so that you know that, if that is the case, this probably isn't going to be the video for you. For everyone else, here is a video about what the mini-budget, the UK economy cratering, trussonomics, and the probability of a Labour majority or Labour-led hung parliament means for football in this country, and particularly the Premier League. I want to start by talking about the collapse in the value of the pound, though that is quite difficult in terms of the specifics of what I mean when I say collapse, given that sterling is so volatile at this moment in time. For most of the last 70 to 80 years, compared to the dollar at least, the pound has been falling in value. Throughout most of the period between 1800 and World War I, spanning more than 100 years, one great British pound was worth around 5 US dollars. Briefly, during the US Civil War, a pound could even buy you $10. But following World War I, and particularly World War II, the value of the dollar has tended to outpace the value of the pound. Still, as recently as 2007, a pound could still buy you $2, but following the global financial crisis, the pound fell rapidly over the next two years, with another significant drop in value following the United Kingdom's decision to leave the European Union in a 2016 referendum. Since then, the pound has bobbled largely around being worth $1.20 to $1.40, but following the announcement of tax cuts and spending pledges in the mini-budget, which spooked the markets, the yield that investors demanded on UK government bonds shot up from less than 2% little over a month ago to more than 4%, and the pound fell to an all-time low versus the dollar of just $1.04. Interventions by the Bank of England have helped to stem that tide, and at the time of this recording, the pound has recovered slightly, up to $1.11. But that is still a significant drop, with many economists predicting that a further decline, possibly even down to parity with the dollar, could still be to come. For most of us, who aren't economists or forex traders, exchange rates can seem quite abstract. 
Aside from if or when we go on holiday to somewhere that uses a different currency, most people probably don't spend too much time worrying about currency fluctuations. However, a decline in the value of the pound doesn't just hurt Brits on their summer holidays, it also impacts the price of everything that a country imports, which, in the case of the United Kingdom, is just about everything. Whether that be food, fuel, or energy, all things that have already shot up in price over the past 6 to 12 months. By the same token, English football clubs obviously deal largely in pounds. And since most of their revenue is in pounds, the decline in the value of the pound, in global terms, means that their revenue has declined. In real terms, what this means is that English football clubs will have to pay higher wages and higher transfer fees just to maintain parity with clubs in countries whose currencies haven't experienced the same drop in value as the pound. What's more, on top of the decline that is already priced in, the volatility of the pound, which many economists predict will not just be a short-term phenomenon, could lead to further uncertainty on the part of players and agents, who could well demand fees and salaries that take that uncertainty into account. We have already seen this play out in Turkey, where the currency really has plummeted, almost by design there, rather than by accident, due to Erdogan's dogma around interest rates and a desire to increase exports. The results in Turkey have been damning, both for the nation's poorest, but also for the country's football clubs who have found it increasingly difficult and expensive to sign players from overseas and have seen their international standing continue to decline. The Turkish lira has lost 80% of its value over the last five years and experienced a 44% decline in 2021 alone. The pound has suffered nowhere near that kind of pain, or not yet at least, but we can expect to see similar consequences for Premier League teams, just on a much more minor scale. It is worth noting that the pound has primarily fallen in value versus the US dollar. Other currencies, including the euro, have also fallen in value versus the dollar over the past year and the past month, albeit just not quite to the same extent. One of the most significant impacts, therefore, is that Premier League teams, other British football clubs, and indeed other European clubs, just to a lesser extent, have just become a lot cheaper for American investors. A 20% fall in the value of the pound versus the dollar might not seem earth-shattering, but in the case of someone like Todd Bowley's consortium taking over at Chelsea last season, it would mean that his £2.5 billion takeover deal would go from costing him US$3.2 billion US dollars to more like US$2.6 billion, a saving of US$600 million. Given that 10 out of the 20 Premier League teams are already either wholly or part-owned by American investors, with that number soon to become 11, and with rumoured interest in a number of British and European clubs before the strengthening of the dollar against other currencies, don't be surprised to see even more American ownership whilst the dollar's purchasing power is so strong. Of course, as we have already established, the revenue of Premier League teams, due to their income primarily being in pounds, has also declined, which means that they are genuinely worth less in some sense. So it isn't as straightforward as a case of clubs who deal in the euro and, particularly the pound, suddenly having become massive bargains. Continued interest in them, therefore, is dependent upon investors having confidence either that the currency won't continue to collapse, or that increases in interest and therefore revenue will outpace the decline in currency valuations. If we do see a further increase in American owners within the Premier League and European game, it is probably a safe bet to assume that we will see further Americanization of the sport and efforts being made to safeguard their investments, as is the case in US sports, through mechanisms such as the removal of promotion and relegation and more unequal distribution of the league's income. It is no surprise that some of the biggest drivers of the European Super League and Project Big Picture proposals were Americans, so the next time similar proposals are made, opposition to them proves to be futile, and football is forever ruined, you can blame Liz Truss, Quasi Quarteng, and the world's most toxic media ecosystem that facilitated their rise to high office, despite their politics and economic policies being opposed by more than three quarters of the great British public. I am only half joking. 
It is not just Americans, the pound is also significantly down over the past year against major currencies of both the Far East and the Middle East, two regions that have also invested heavily in European football over recent years. The real danger comes, for the Premier League at least, if the pound were to fall against the euro in similar magnitude to its decline against the dollar, since almost all of the clubs that the Premier League competes with in Europe are within the eurozone. Over the past few years, the Premier League has gone from just being the richest of the big five leagues to being so financially dominant that newly promoted Premier League teams can have a greater net spend during a transfer window than the clubs in all of Europe's other leagues combined. As I recently covered, in this video questioning whether the Premier League has broken the transfer market and could already be considered to be a Super League. If the pound were to experience real pain versus the Euro, that would throw La Liga, Bundesliga and Serie A sides a real lifeline in the battle against Premier League supremacy. And Premier League clubs will be relieved that, as of yet, the pound has only lost 5% of its value against the Euro over the past 6 months and just 2% in the last month alone, thanks to that recent rebound. Another significant consideration for football clubs is the massive hike in interest rates. The Bank of England recently raised interest rates for the seventh successive occasion, increasing rates to 2.25% in an effort to combat rampant inflation. Whilst 2.25% is not enormous in historical terms, it comes in the context of rates having been sub-2% since 2008, effectively zero for more than a decade, and literally just 0.1% as recently as March 2020. Again, this might seem quite abstract for some people, particularly if you don't own a house with a mortgage or have any considerable debts. But interest rates dictate how much it costs to borrow money, so when they rise, borrowing becomes more expensive for everyone, whether that is the government themselves, individuals, companies, and indeed football clubs. Whilst rates have been rising consistently, but gradually since the pandemic, forecasters now predict a really sharp and painful hike in light of the government's mini-budget, the fallout from those policy announcements, and the devaluation of the pound. The market is now predicting that the Bank of England's base rate will rise above 4% before the end of 2022 and could go as high as 5.5% by July 2023. It is this predicted rise which has seen a number of banks and lenders withdraw their mortgage offers to clients, either refusing to lend the money outright or offering them revised mortgages with much higher interest rates. An audience member on the BBC television programme Question Time recently told a panel including a Conservative minister that the mortgage offer that she had received at a rate of 4.5% had been withdrawn and that the best rate that she could now get was 10.5%, prompting audible gasps from fellow audience members. Based on the average UK property price of £281,000 and the average deposit of £33,000 on a 25-year mortgage, that would mean a monthly payment would go from being £1,378.46 to £2,341.57, an increase of £963. For any non-UK viewers out there, most households in the United Kingdom could not afford to absorb an extra £963 expense every month before the rampant inflation in the price of food, energy, and other essentials in recent months, let alone now. The rise in interest rates is also really significant for football clubs, given the huge amount of debt in football these days. Manchester United and Tottenham, for example, have roughly £1.5 billion of debt between them. For Tottenham, the vast majority of that debt was taken out to finance the construction of the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, is fixed at a very low interest rate and doesn't need to be repaid until 2042. But that isn't the case for everyone. Manchester United, for instance, are doubly impacted because whilst their revenue is primarily in pounds, meaning that it has decreased, their debt is mostly in dollars, meaning that it has increased. When Manchester United published their most recent set of accounts, the club's $650 million of debt, borrowed from US banks, was valued at £530 million, based on the June 30th exchange rate. 
As Kieran Maguire pointed out on Twitter though, on September 26th, the fall in the pound and strengthening of the dollar meant that $650 million of debt owed to US banks was now worth £612 million, an increase of £82 million. Or enough to sign Harry Maguire again with £2 million quid left over. The currencies have moved around a bit since then and will continue to do so, but you start to get an idea here of how all of these economic crises intertwine with some pretty major consequences. It's also not just new debt that is the problem, and the fact that clubs may be more reluctant to take on debt to fund new signings, salaries, and infrastructure projects. It is also existing debt, which may only be fixed at a certain rate for a certain amount of time, and will become more expensive to service when those fixes end, just like individual household mortgages. Any increase in the cost of servicing debt, and the likes of Arsenal, Leicester, Brighton and Everton, in addition to Manchester United and Tottenham, all have in excess of £200 million of gross debt as per their most recent set of accounts, is likely to come out of investment that would have been made in a club's football operations, whether that be transfers, wages or academy spending. To add insult to injury, specifically for Manchester United fans, their club also pays the Glazers dividend payments in US dollars. One of the most controversial policies introduced as part of the recent mini budget was the abolition of the top rate of tax. As things stand, in the United Kingdom, there are three income tax brackets, 20% on anything between £12,571 to £50,270, 40% on anything between £50,271 to £150,000, and then 45% on anything above £150,000. That is, complicated slightly by the £12,570 personal allowance that tapers off between £100 and £125,000, creating effectively a 60% marginal tax rate and the loss of certain benefits like childcare and so on. But we don't need to get into all of that. Liz Truss and Quasi Kwarteng decided, in a shock move, to remove the 45% tax rate entirely, meaning that the 40% tax rate, which kicks in above £50,271, will be the highest income tax bracket. It means that someone on a £1 million salary, for example, will be taxed at the same top rate as someone who earns just £60,000, Multi-millionaires will have fewer deductions, proportionally, than middle to high earning graduates, and just 2,500 people who earn in excess of £3.5 million a year will receive a combined tax cut worth £1 billion. That includes several Premier League footballers, Cristiano Ronaldo, who is the highest paid player in the Premier League for example, is expected to rake in an extra £1.3 million a year as a result of Truss's tax cuts. Meanwhile, someone who earns £20,000 a year will get around an extra £120, which won't be anywhere near enough to combat their rise in food prices, energy bills, and either their rent or mortgage payments once they're fixed, if they even have one, comes to a conclusion. This is a policy, according to polling by YouGov, which 82% of the electorate would like to see reversed, somewhat unsurprisingly given that virtually no one expected or was even calling for it, and only 1.1% of the British public will actually benefit from it. From the perspective of Premier League and Championship football clubs, where the average player earns well in excess of £150,000 a year, with an average of around £3 million in the Premier League, it is certainly possible to argue that the abolition of the top rate of income tax is a good thing. If a player were to look at their after-tax earnings, rather than before tax, the Premier League has just become 5% more attractive without Premier League teams spending a single penny. Of course, the market's response to that policy, among others, and the subsequent devaluation of the pound has seen that 5% eaten up in comparison to the dollar and even the euro over the past six months, but in isolation, Premier League players belong to the tiny number of soup high earners who would actually benefit as a result of the 45% tax rate getting axed. The government's logic is that by cutting that top rate of tax, the UK will become more attractive to soup high earners, people will work harder for longer hours, and become more entrepreneurial. 
Since footballers actually represent a not insignificant proportion of people whose salaries are in the millions via PAYE, rather than earning that amount through dividends, capital gains, and trusts, which is how the super rich actually accumulate most of their wealth, and where tax rates are even lower and, in some cases, non existent, it is worth putting that theory to the test with them. We have already addressed the fact that it is conceivable that the higher after tax earnings could help attract players, though in reality, it is really the clubs that benefit, since it means that they will just be able to offer players 5% less than they would otherwise have to, and most, if not, all of that gain has been eroded by the weakening of the pound. Beyond that, how many footballers, do you suppose, will train harder and longer, be more creative or play better due to tax incentives? Alternatively, how many League One players earning £2,000 a week will now decide that, do you know what, I was happy playing League One football for a hundred grand a year to avoid paying a marginal 45% tax rate, but now that they've got rid of it, I think I might actually put a shift in, join a Premier League team and earn £10 million a year instead. I would wager the entirety of this fictional footballer's tax savings that the answer is absolutely none, and the same applies outside of football. No one doesn't pursue a good idea, work hard, or seek to progress their own careers because of an extra 5% tax rate on a percentage of their extra income. As one tweet that I read sarcastically put it, I was content earning £30,000 a year, but now that they've scrapped the top rate of tax, I think I'll earn more than £150,000 instead. Back in the real world, Whilst Premier League players, City bankers, and the partners at law firms just got a 5% tax cut, most football fans will experience a real terms pay cut. There is a very real threat, and near certainty I would suggest, that the rise in people's cost of living will squeeze even more low-income families out of football, who already struggle to keep up with the rising cost of tickets, travel, merchandise, and even just the extortionate cost of watching football in the UK, whether that be on Sky Sports, BT Sport, and now occasionally on Amazon Prime. The top teams are likely to be relatively insulated from the drop-off in fans who can afford to attend, watch, and even engage with football, insulated by their global fan bases and tourists who travel to the UK to watch games, which means that, inevitably, just as is the case outside of football, the rich are likely to get richer whilst the poor get poorer as a result of this policy program, as inequality continues to rise. The United Kingdom has a notoriously high threshold for rioting. Whilst in France, a 0.5% tax rise on baguettes would lead to protesters tearing down the Louvre and setting the Palace of Versailles ablaze, you can basically subject Brits to near-total destitution, and so long as their neighbours are suffering as badly as them, if not worse, they will sit idly by and won't kick up too much of a fuss. There are signs, though, that even in England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the famously mild-mannered are having their patience tested to the limits. A significant number of unions, in key sectors required for the country to function, are either on strike at the moment or are balloting their members about the possibility of taking industrial action. There is a mass campaign called Don't Pay UK, threatening to stop paying energy bills entirely, which might be better named Can't Pay UK, given that that is the reality for millions of people in the United Kingdom. The Enough is Enough campaign has attracted 700,000 members in a matter of weeks or months, holding rallies and marches across the country, protesting the falling living standards for ordinary people, with five key demands, all of which enjoy a large majority of support from the public at large when polled. There is a possibility that things could get really bad this winter, and that we could see riots, civil disobedience, and a general strike. In short, the United Kingdom could become a very turbulent place, and it would be naive to think that wouldn't have ramifications for football. Even for the highest paid, like footballers, restaurants, bars, and cultural centres shutting down will make the United Kingdom a more miserable place to live, Enforced industrial action has the power to grind the country to a halt, regardless of your bank balance, and no matter how much money you earn, most people don't actually want to live in a powder keg that is just about ready to explode. Least of all footballers, who are among the tiny number of extremely high earners who tend to come from impoverished backgrounds. 
aside from the economic repercussions of the recent mini-budget, which it is important to point out hasn't actually passed Parliament yet, and whilst it is almost unprecedented for a policy programme this important not to pass through government, at least without there being a leadership challenge or a general election as a result, there is talk of rebel Conservative MPs voting with Labour and other opposition parties to at least curb the worst excesses of trust and Quarteng's Britannia Unchained Undeals, but aside from that, there is also the small matter of the fan-led review into football governance and the implementation of an independent regulator. Oh, and by the way, just like that, literally as I was recording this, the government has U-turned on abolishing the top rate of tax just 24 hours after Liz Truss went on national television and said that she was absolutely committed to abolishing the 45% tax rate, and we were told by lots of very reputable newspapers that the lady is not for turning. It turns out that she is for turning, even on one of the flagship policies of her government's first economic program. One presumes as a result of severe backlash and the market tanking, but also, perhaps, out of sheer spite for me and an attempt to ruin this video before I've even uploaded it. By the time this video comes out, she'll probably have introduced a 60% tax rate for super high earners, have nationalised all of the utilities, and introduced Maoist land reforms just to make me look stupid. Of course, the emergency response from the Bank of England to the mini-budget can't be U-turned because it has already happened, nor can any of the damage that has already been cemented be overturned, but all is not lost because the Conservatives U-turning, reneging on their promises, and just being generally deceitful and dishonest is actually a very useful segue into my next point. In the Conservative manifesto at the 2019 general election, the party, then led by Alexander Boris de Perfeffel Johnson, promised a fan-led review into football governance in the United Kingdom. That review was led by Conservative MP Tracy Crouch, and it made 10 recommendations to the government, the most important of which was the creation of an independent regulator. Johnson promised to follow all of Crouch's recommendations, and the creation of an independent regulator was therefore being actively pursued, we are told, by Johnson whilst he was in number 10. Now that Johnson is gone though, replaced by Liz Truss, the proposals, including that key one around an independent regulator, have been thrown into doubt. Truss is a free market zealot, and most likely considers the term regulator in of itself to be a curse word. So despite her mandate as Prime Minister coming from the electorate in 2019, who gave her party a large majority in government, whilst promising a fan-led review and subsequently promising to take on board the recommendations of that review whilst in government, it now seems unlikely that that will actually happen. The Conservatives promised a lot of things in 2019, like levelling up Britain's poorest towns and cities before doing the exact opposite, but it is likely that they will actually take a fair bit of heat for reneging on their promises to form an independent regulator, which has prominent backers within the media, like Gary Neville, whereas the victims of the levelling up lies are effectively voiceless within the national conversation. The theory behind establishing an independent regulator is that football clubs are self-interested, which means that their views are based largely upon their own predicaments rather than what is right or reasonable. As such, clubs, leagues, and governing bodies have long been at loggerheads, during which time we have seen clubs like Bury and Macclesfield Town go to the wall, very nearly joined by Derby County, as well as a major debacle surrounding Roman Abramovich's ownership of Chelsea following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Since the clubs and leagues can't seem to agree upon anything, in short, football has proven that it is itself incapable of sorting out its own problems, hence the need for an independent body that can help safeguard clubs, their futures, and look after the grassroots of the sport. It is possible that Truss will still introduce an independent regulator, despite the suggestions made by her aides and colleagues to the contrary, and in spite of her own best instincts, because it is largely supported by football fans, and boy oh boy, could she do with some popularity right now. As for the proposed gambling ban, that was widely expected to be brought in by the government, banning gambling sponsors at least from being the main sponsors on the front of football shirts, along with a raft of other reforms, 
Well, that too is now in doubt. Some of Truss's most prominent allies within the party back the proposals, but it would also appear to go against her libertarian instincts. And above all else, a lot of these issues around football are likely to be put on the back burner in light of the myriad of crises, some inherited and some self-inflicted, that a government has to contend with and the sheer magnitude of them. Given Labour's enormous poll lead, many are now predicting that Keir Starmer will form the United Kingdom's next government. What that means for the country at large is fairly unclear. The former head of the Crown Prosecution Service, Starmer was elected as Labour leader on 10 pledges, which included common ownership of rail, mail, energy and water, and increasing the income tax on the top 5% of highest earners. Starmer has since U-turned and scrapped those pledges, but when it comes to football, we probably have a better idea of what to expect. Since Starmer was elected Labour leader, oddly enough, Gary Neville has become one of the most prominent voices within the Labour Party, and whatever you think of the pundit, podcaster, football club owner, and property developer, his views on reforming the game are certainly very well documented. Indeed, he has just authored an entire book about them. Given that Neville would appear to have Starmer's ear, Neville's reforms would most likely be Labour's reforms in government, not that they are particularly radical, since most were already promised, just not delivered upon by the Tories, following Tracy Crouch's review. So that is it for today's video, which was long and could have been much longer. To summarise, the UK is on fire, the government are arsonists, and the opposition are proposing that we fire a pipette's worth of water at the problem whilst wearing suits and ties with a smart haircut and all being very sensible about it. God help us all. As far as football is concerned, buying and paying players just got a lot more expensive for British clubs, the clubs themselves just got a lot cheaper for Americans and those in the Middle and Far East, borrowing money and servicing debt has also become a whole lot more expensive, and ordinary people and ordinary football fans will bear the brunt of cuts to services and their declining living standards, just as they always do. Thank you all very much as ever for watching today's video. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for hitc 7s You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.